You are now listening to the Griot's Black Podcast Network, Black Culture Amplified. What's going on, everybody? And welcome to Dear Culture, the podcast for buying about the culture here on the Griot Black Podcast Network. I'm your host, Panama Jackson, and we are joined today by a special guest. Now, I say that every time. I really do say special guest every single time. But you know what? All of our guests are special. And the reason I'm saying it again this time is because our guest today is an actress. She's a writer. She's a director. She's a producer. She's an activist. She's probably a DJ. She's probably out here (laughs) spitting bars because she's been on Wu-Tang shows. She does it all. And, you know, she was out here hanging with the with the VP and the president at a Juneteenth ceremony here in Washington, D.C. My guest today is none other than Erica Alexander. How are you doing today? Yay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm good, Panama. Thank you for the invitation to be here. And yes, I was at the Juneteenth celebration on the front lawn of the White House because it's the first one that's ever been done. And I was invited and I was glad to to hang out and everyone had their phones out. It was a fantastic day and uh, there'll be many more. But that was the first one that's ever been done in history. So there you go at the White House. Yeah. And people definitely had their phones out because that's how I knew you were there. I live in D.C. Every friend of mine was popping pictures and putting things in their Instagram stories. I'm like, oh, yo, she's here in D.C. She's out here hanging out at a wonderful what looked to be a wonderful Juneteenth uh, celebration with a wonderful lineup. So kudos to you. I hope you had a really good time. It was. We had church out on the on the front lawn. People were, mm-mm, 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 mm-mm. they were some uh, gospel choir that showed up and everybody showed out. And I'm a preacher's daughter and they probably got all sorts of uh crazy uh you know situations for me but we all had a great time it was really <laughs> kind of one thing when i when i knew i was gonna have an opportunity to speak with you the first word that came to mind was legacy and that's for a couple reasons one is because of the work that you've done as an actress and the other is because of the work that you've done behind the camera and we're going to talk about both those different facets of it because i think you're somebody who whose legacy is quite quite cemented, but is also constantly in motion. Now, everybody knows you, everybody that I know anyway, knows you, of course, because of one of the most iconic roles in, in I was about to say black television, I'm just gonna say television, one of the most iconic roles in television of Maxine Shaw, part of the cat ensemble cast on the show, Living Single, which is one of my favorite shows. I watch it in syndication. I don't know what streaming service it's on, but I go back and watch the episodes because it's so, It was just good TV. Now, when you were making Living Single, did you see it being the kind of show that still mattered in 2023 that people were going to be referencing on trivia questions and every black game that exists where where people still talking about riding the Maverick? And I have a T-shirt that says that I did not wear it today. And I feel I'm very sad about that. But, you know, did you know what y'all were making? Did you see it? Uh, I like to say we did because we had been a part of a real powerful um, power play on television, starting with The Cosby Show and then on The Different World. And of course, in film, you had Robert Townsend and Spike Lee and many players who were doing work that was not only culturally relevant, but also American, um, you know, television and film and, and creating a, Uh, a new way to to look at who could be in that space and occupy it. I'm glad that you actually changed your wording and you did. You said uh, black television and you said, no, you said American television, because the truth is there's the only one designation we get. We don't ever say Asian TV or or a show with an all Asian cast and uh, only we say uh, a black show, but there's no such thing. There's uh, shows with black casts and um, that actual designation was one of the things that we were fighting against when we were uh, starting to do our show because no one ever said that Cosby Show was a black show, ever. They always said that it was must-see TV. In fact, he created it uh, with that show and the success of it. So we thought coming in as kids who were um, in their 20s, early 20s in the 90s, and that's from Wu-Tang on, a lot of us are in that same age range, that we could make a difference and that we could create the new new and that it would have impact. And so, you know, I'm just humble bragging saying, no, we did not know eventually what it would become because no one knows. But the truth is we set out to have a significant uh, play and relevance in the future of the culture of in American culture on TV. 
You know, it's interesting because the idea of like black TV versus just TV in general, like part of me is like, it's just television, right? Like I, I and, but it's funny because, and I, I, say, I always say black because I mean, one, this is a black podcast, so to speak, in terms of the goals of it, right? The goals are highlighting and amplifying black culture, you know, full stop. But it's funny because in my own household, like things that centered and represented blackness was the main, was that was like the mainstream, right? Like I didn't, like, I never called the other shows white TV, but that's effectively what they were to me, right? Because in my house, if it had black people in it, that's what we were watching, right? Like if it had black people on the, except for, you know, like Bobby Caldwell and, you know, Michael McDonald and them, just the standard issue, you know, black, white folks that showed up at black households just because, <laughs> you know, they sound yeah. like black people. All in those. But, yeah, listen, definitely hauling. That was my that was my my Saturday and Sunday morning cleaning music was hauling notes in my household. It's funny because this conversation about black TV versus like TV, we got to have the friends convo. Got to do it because whenever I see a conversation about friends and living single, you're always a part of that conversation. One, how did you end up as the vocal part of that conversation, and how is it how important is it that we continue to have this conversation to discuss? Like not only representation, but being properly acknowledged for what you brought to the table and how that influenced TV that we often get erased from. Yeah, you know, I'm a mouthy person. I'm always talking about something. I'm also an activist and advocate for different types of organizations for girls and women. And for many of the things that I've done in this world, um, one of the first things they want to talk about is living single. And so I would honest as as honestly as I could answer, excuse me, I would talk about anything and everything. And there seemed to be a thing that was bubbling up because people in new generations, whether it's millennials like yourself and or, you know, alphas, we're seeing it in syndication and having and putting sort of the threads together of what came first, who came first and those types of things. And it really matters inside of culture and community that are marginalized, that we get our props and our due, whether it's for rock and roll, jazz, the blues, hip hop, um, you know, all these things, R&B, we're often discounted. And um, they saw the connection that we were both produced by the same production company, but friends being in the so-called mainstream. And I use that very loosely because I don't right. I believe in that because as you say, black culture is mainstream culture, but it's marginalized by a, a, a media and advertising and branding that um, marginalizes it. Um, they saw that it was, uh, they thought it was being ripped off. And I had a little Twitter, you know, sort of back and forth with David Schwimmer, who's was just doing a nice interview. He didn't know he was stepping into it. And he said that maybe perhaps one day um, in this world uh, that there would be a black friends and or an Asian friends. And I Twittered back that he didn't know it, but he was actually the white living single. And then black Twitter took it from there. Media magazine called me and said, would you do an article on this? And I thought it was important, Panama, that you can't have a conversation about something that's important in 140 characters. So I did that article. And the next thing you know, I became the unofficial spokesperson <laughs> for that. But I never you really meant to. are. I never meant to. Be. But I mean, that work is important. So it's much appreciated. Like every time, you know, I don't think we we do enough to really dig deep into that stuff. Like we kind of, like the conversation always happens, but then it dies off and then it comes back you know, as like shows like Living Single, they're not going anywhere. Like we still watch like people like me who grew up watching these shows. Like, you know, I was a teenager when Living Single came out, but, you know, I it's still a part of my life. You know, like I know all the characters like the back of my hand. Right. Like, hell, I wanted to be like Khadija. I wanted to run Flavor. Like I wanted to run a magazine. Like I wanted to do that. You know, we all have friends like 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 Overton. And it, I don't know if I have a friend like Sinclair necessarily, but, you know, I wish I did because it seemed like a lot of fun. Right. So. You know, I think those conversations are important. So the work that you're doing, again, this is why I use the word legacy. And I want to keep that going because I read an article that uh, or an interview that you did where you talked about how after Living Single ended, I think you might have expected more opportunities to present themselves. So I, this must have been like very early after the show uh, wrapped or maybe it was just in, in retrospective. But, you know, you have been a part of some of the most iconic television that I can think of 
especially as it relates to black people and representation. So this is going to be off the top of my head. I know you were an insecure. You run the world, which is on now. I'm, I'm you know, I laughed <laughs> at your role, at your role and run the, and run the world. Uh, yes. Insecure. Oh, I said insecure. Queen Sugar, which is one of my absolute favorite television shows of all time, just because mm-hmm. it's a story we've never seen before in any capacity. Um, and, you know, I just love it. But and you were in the, the Wu-Tang, the Wu-Tang and Amer- Wu-Tang and American Saga, I mm-hmm. think is the official name of that show. Yes. Among others, like you're on all of these shows that are very essential, especially to our community and the way that we see ourselves and representation. So, you know, I guess looking back now and I and I understand that I'm looking at it from I see you on TV right? I see you there. And that to me, who's not in the TV world is like, oh, wow, you're there. You're made. And, and, and then, you did, you know, you've been ERS. You, you done a whole medical the whole medical show run, like which is <laughs> is like, the you know, like I turn on my TV and then boom, there you are. Mm-hmm. Do you still feel that way about like the career that you've had looking back? And is does that has that has that changed or is it more because you're in it in like the roles haven't either manifested themselves in ways that you feel are like match your career and talent and what you should have gotten? Well, you know, I guess there could be a conversation about should have, could have, would have, but I do know this, that a person, and again, as a humble brag, who has as many, as much range as I do. And has mm-hmm. said in some of the most successful shows in history of television and on stage and then also um, um, film get out in certain things. <laughs> yes. You believe that you uh, have earned the right to be in consideration for roles, for lead roles, and that you can um, <clears throat> hold a show. Uh, and there are a lot of people who thought I could. The problem is, is there's systemic racism and white supremacy as well. And so it wants to build with who it wants to build with. And so I'm not unlike many of people who have tried and, um, again, come from marginalized communities who are undermined and undervalued. And so I represent a more vocal maybe person to saying that, uh, yes, I was disappointed with the opportunities that were offered that I was offered uh, thereafter. And I was gratified in many ways that I use that time to grow and uh, build my skill set, whether it was writing, directing, producing and those things like that, doing comic books, all those other things. I wouldn't have had the time to do it if I hadn't, uh, if I'd been working on and on and on. And I have lasted more than most, even the biggest uh, stars who have uh, whiter skin haven't lasted as long as I next year it'll be 40 years that I've been in the business and I feel like I'm mentally healthy I'm resilient I've been building all along I've been trying to create opportunities for young people for older people for people who are disabled people who are um, you know, differently gendered from that come from different uh, geographic areas. I've been trying to build not for myself, but for the industry itself. So I'll look at it this way, that yes, it was disappointing. It was tough. And yet, you know, uh, that's when you can uh, build sometime the biggest opportunity for yourself and ultimately for um, the entertainment industry, which I always say the soft power of America is entertainment. And it's the most powerful we have, um, tool that we have for change. So let's see if that happens. All right. So we're going to take a real quick break here. Um, and we come back, we're going to talk a bit about the other side of this legacy conversation, which you just led right into where you're creating opportunities for, for viewing things in a different way. So stay tuned right here on Dear Culture with Erica Alexander. The 80s gave us unforgettable songs from Bob Marley, De La Soul, and Public Enemy. I'm a black man, and I can never be a veteran. Being Black, the 80s is a podcast docuseries hosted by me, Torre, looking at the most important issues of the 80s through the songs of the decade. A decade when crack kingpins controlled the streets, but lost their humanity. You couldn't be like those soft, smiling, happy-go-lucky drug dealers. You had to suppress that. It was a time when disco was part of gay liberation. It provided the information to counter narratives that were given to gay people by the straight world. This is the funkiest history class you'll ever take. Join me, Torre, for Being Black the 80s on the Grio Black Podcast Network or wherever you listen to podcasts. 
All right, we're back here on Dear Culture, and I'm joined by Erica Alexander, and we're talking about uh, legacy for me, anyway. That's that's what that's the framing of this conversation, and one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about that is because you've done amazing work uh, in front of the camera, where you and all these iconic roles, you're anywhere, like you mentioned, Get Out, you've done film, TV, you've done. Whenever I see you on screen, it's always a joy, right? I'm always like, oh, here we go. Like, I, I know I'm watching some quality. That's how I genuinely feel. Hey. You've also done some amazing work behind the camera. Uh, and in particular, I want to talk about, so you you did the, the John Lewis Good Trouble documentary, which I really enjoyed. I, actually, I, I genuinely enjoyed that. So kudos to you. You're one of the producers on that. Um, but you did this, the big payback, this reparations doc, which we got to talk about. Cannot pay my grandfather back. He's dead. Give us what we're due. I don't think it's gonna go too far or anywhere. I'm still not prepared to join an insurrection. I just want you to understand who we are. For one, what brought you to the to the to the reparations convo in such a way that made you want to create a documentary about the conversation and about what was happening in Evanston, uh, Illinois? Like what what brought you there? How did you get there? Well, it turns out I got skin in the game. <laughs> <laughs> you don't say. You don't say. And I tell you, at some point in your life, you start to look at um, the reasons why there are certain obstacles or you start to learn with the 1619 Project or the Tana Hasi Coates article. Um, uh, and uh, just even your parents and your and your grandparents or even the school and education that you have. Um, why things are the way they are. And it keeps pointing back to um, thinking that, you know, Tanasi said this recently. I just ran into him at a summit. He said, you know, you just some things you can't vote out. They're they're at the core, um, you know, built wrong. And why is that? And you start to think about reparations, reparations. Why? Because we're talking about uh, the first reconstruction having failed just after slavery and then second reconstruction stopping after the assassination of Martin Luther King. And that Reverend Barber of the Poor People's Campaign says this is the third reconstruction and that we're in the midst of being the architects, all of us, if we know, if we if we are aware that we are in the third reconstruction. And what could we do to bring our best selves to it, to rebuild America the way it was meant to be, um, you know, um, from sea to, sea to shining sea. And I thought I'm a creator. My tools are, you know, um, probably the most powerful tools in the world. Because I say that, you know, that the battleground is really the circumference of our head about 22 inches around and um, the imagination and what we can imagine uh, we can usually create. But we can't create it if the uh, the, the, the foundations that we're building on are, are corrupt. And so. I wanted to tell that tale and it turns out we started to make a reparations documentary. And then I went on the breakfast club and Charlemagne was like, yo queen, after I, you want to do a <laughs> podcast about, uh, about uh, reparations. And I said, uh, okay. So we did a companion podcast. My co-director Whitney Dow who was a white man. Uh, we, while we were doing this, did the podcast 12 episodes and then I, all the while was creating this uh, documentary. And then while we were doing it, we got a call from um, one of the people who supported the documentary early on, Katie Barksdale. And she said, you gotta get down to Evanston. Uh, someone's passed the first tax funded reparations bill in, in um, for African-Americans in history. And it was Robin Rue Simmons, Alder woman Robin Rue Simmons. So we decided to switch lanes and do a verite film about her journey and link it to H.R. 40, which is the bill to study reparations and make recommendations with Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. And so that's what it became. That's why I did it, because I was curious about what um, things were in there. And then suddenly we were able to follow American history being made in real life. We in Evanston are leading the way to heal a nation. We don't want a piece of freedom. We want the whole package and that's reparations. It's such a compelling doc, mostly because watching it in like current time, I know it starts in like 2019, but you have to go through COVID. You know, one of the principals in there passes away from COVID. Um, it was really interesting to see the different perspectives. Like there's a white woman from South Africa who is very compelled to make reparations, which I mean, you know, she's not even American. She, you know, she clearly moved over here at some point. She still has her accent, but she's even questioning like, you know, I feel like we have to do something, but 
am I willing to give up money for this? Did you have, you know, the white guy who was like, man, to hell with reparations. I don't buy this. But you also have the black conservative male, you know, who unfortunately who passed away during the, the creation of this thing, who is talking about like, I don't believe in this like this. We, we, you know, we kind of pull ourselves up from our bootstraps type of, you know, type of thing. And it was so interesting just watching like individual stories that coalesce with like the larger conversation that happens nationally. It's clearly a national conversation that happens in the halls of Congress and all that. But there was such a funny quote to me in this, not funny, but it looks funny in retrospect where somebody on, I think it was on the radio on a phone call calling into some shows like, you know, we're going to get Juneteenth before we get reparations and boom, we get Juneteenth well before the, the reparations conversation sometimes feels like a non-starter. So like, let me ask you, since we did get Juneteenth, a move in the right direction, why was the why is this the time to really kick this conversation into high gear? I mean, it's always the right time, but is this like the time in history to really make this happen? And in in a space when there's so much opposition now, like after George Floyd passes away, everybody was like black, all black, everything. Now everybody's like, man, to hell with blackness. I don't want no black books. I don't want no black nothing. Like, get y'all get out of Florida. Like, everything that can be done seems like it's gone the complete opposite direction. Like, where do you see the reparations conversation now? And is this the right time to, like, push this, like, really try to get the H.R. 40 across the finish line? It's not only the right time. It's been past the right time. They tried with the so-called 40 acres and a mule to give us reparations because they knew that black people newly freed with no citizenship and or no homes, nothing that they owned really um, outside of whether you were freedsmen or not, um, that they would need something to, uh, to, to give them. And when I say give them something that I say we've earned, but you know, for the purposes of this conversation. And so uh, they, uh, they, they designated a, a specific part of the coast and, um, said that uh, that should happen. And then Lincoln was assassinated and they got that Confederate um, uh, vice president in there, basically sympathizer, and um, it was over. And then we suffered the brutality of lynchings and torture and terrorism up until the 50s. They said, enough is enough. We need civil rights. We need to be able to vote. We'll never be able to vote these people out of here. They're torturing us. They're killing us. They're raping us. They're doing all the same things they did in slavery. Um, and, um, and we don't have any protections. And then that sparked the civil rights era. And then after Martin Luther King was assassinated, we went through a whole other thing that was with the mass incarceration and the drugs and the, uh, all the horrible housing that had never, we'd never had proper housing and education and all these things were not properly uh, vetted or had, uh, you know, properly funded uh, the, the, People who fought in wars came home and didn't have the GI Bill. It was just so much systemic and it's true evil just built into the system. And so I think that um, not only was it past time, Reverend Barber talks about a moral revival. And I mentioned him a lot because he's a mentor. I'm not necessarily religious. I'm a very spiritual person. He says that America must, cannot be unless it rights the wrongs that it knows are outstanding. And that is for its own sake. If America is an idea and the idea is corrupted at its core, then we're all talking nonsense and everybody can keep piling on. But you're piling on it to, um, they say, a burning house or, you know, or you know, a steaming pile. You know, so we either need to get with it for all our sakes. And I mean, reparations, they always put it in positioning of saving black people. It's saving white people. White people need to atone for the sins of the past, not because they've done them or they participated directly. Indirectly, their whole lives are built on something that is a lie and that continues to feed upon the lie, whether it's the, 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 the housing situation, the financial situation, the way we treat the world. The European colonization situation is now being vetted by everybody, whether it's the Commonwealth or in Africa, they're saying, no, 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 you can't come over here. The Commonwealth is saying, no, 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 to the queen. So all these things are happening. So I'm saying at this, this is maybe could be the sunset of humanity. What are we going to do? How are we going to say that we tried to build a version that had equal rights for everybody? Well, then only thing you can do is say, we're now going to go back and we're going to rebalance the scales, knowing that it was built against you. Now we're going to address it. So my child 
white, black, or otherwise, can lift their head and say, my grandparents, my parents, they did the right thing, so now I can walk into the future with a possibility of the same thing. You know, one of the most interesting things about that doc to me was that, and this was a conversation I think we always have in the community when it comes to reparations, is like, what does that look like? Like, how do you actually pay that debt and right that wrong? Like, we always talk about reparations in the form of a check, and I think that's how most people think of it. But I also very much understood the older woman who's trying to figure out, like, like, how do we actually create a space that gets to wealth building? Like, is a check going to do that? And this is I mean, this is a conversation we've all had. I mean, even Chappelle spoofed it on the show years ago. Like everybody, you know, I when I was in grad school, I actually have a master's in public policy and my focus was on social social policy in one of my classes. I wrote a series of papers about reparations, largely based on H.R. 40 and the idea that the government is responsible for this because the government allowed it. So we need to be approaching this from the government angle as, you know, as obviously how most people, I think, think of it now and that the government should be atoning for the wrongs. But what does that even look like? And one of the biggest arguments I got in with my professor was, how do you actually do that? Now, he was a black guy who did not like rep- the idea of reparations. He hated it. So he murdered my paper. You know, I was all about the education reforms and housing reforms and all of that type of stuff. And, but that's contentious, even amongst arguing with my boys about this stuff. We're like, nah, man, I need to check. Some like, no, we need, we need a central bank for black people that does these things that we can all, you know, all these kind of things. Like, you know, what does atoning even look like? And what is it going to take to get that over the hump in your mind? I think HR 40 is on the right pace. They're looking to do a study and then make recommendations. They're looking right. to go the power, congressional power to open up the books, whether it's financial, education, insurance, you know, uh, whatever, and make the case for reparations. And that will also inform the how. We can have opinions about it, but America has paid debts all over the place all the time. It's paying the debts for Ukraine right now. It's giving them, they don't say, how how can we fight this war? Right. They go and they get it done and they, you know, write a big old check and then they give it to Ukraine. But they also find out from the Defense Department how to do it. There could be a Department of Reparations. They really could be just to take this on. And um, I think that America takes on big questions. But to keep pushing this down the road and it's acting like, oh, it's so big, we can't deal with it. And how could we pay it? Um, There truly is no amount dollar amount they could ever give for the disaster and the evil and destruction that and the havoc that was put upon our people and certainly the continent of Africa. Um, um, but um, we can also discuss that we are deserved, they're deserving of it. We can, um, I'm glad that you threw your hat in it as a student. You, you're brave and, and you, he murdered your paper, but he didn't mur- murder your spirit. You know what I'm saying? Right. You, your Harriet's child, you meant to go into the sticky waters of the swamp and come out scratched up and go back because um, we need to have this conversation. But also, although I really love Dave Chappelle and I'm a fan, the fact that they always show black people spending it and wasting it away treats us like we are um, wards of the state. Well, today, the first checks were sent out. That's right, baby. I just bought this truck straight cash. And I got enough cigarettes to last me and my family for the rest of our lives. And that is uh, not only insulting, they didn't ask the Japanese in after the internment how they'd spend the money that they gave them in the 70s and the 80s. They, they knew that they needed to right a wrong and they didn't paint them as people that were foolish, that would go spend it on everything they didn't need. But frankly, if you write me a check, you don't have the right to tell me what to do with it. It's none of your business what happened. I can do what I want because all these years and all those years, you didn't give them the right to own themselves, their lives, their children, their anything. And there's so many stories of how they were able to uh, subsume and and just, you know, continue to dominate all facets of their life and their thinking and their health or whatever. Now you don't get to tell Black people that. We also need to create storytelling around it, narrative change, because we can't keep taking on the narratives that they've given us, color people's time. We take that on and we laugh, but the truth is there were white people who told us over and over again as we were cleaning their butts and taking care of their children that we were lazy and shiftless. And this is after we had built the country and made it strong. And then take that on like, well, you know, color people, that's bull. What the new, um, uh, uh, narrative around that needs to be the darker the skin the earlier in that's what i say that's where we need to start to keep 
digging and mining that and creating us not only this super brilliant people that we are that created even whole new um, cultural uh, standards and, and ways and, you know, music and styles and everything and is the epitome of, of phys physicality, but also of the Minecraft, again, the imagination, the way we think. And then we'll start to tell a better story of who we are and they'll start to see not only they don't need to agree that we deserve it. The United States needs to pay it. And that's what it is. I feel like you just put me at the end of the line. Uh, but, you know, that hurts my heart a little bit. You know, I just I don't appreciate that. I got to say, but, you know, what am I? I can't argue. I, I can't I can't argue that it hurts my heart a little bit, but I'm, I'm going to let that one cook. Um, <laughs> you know, interestingly, so I used to work. I actually used to work on Capitol Hill. And it's funny that the idea that they won't even pass the bill, like mark it up out of committee and sign it that for something that just does a study, because you know what, what I do know from firsthand experiences, typically when they don't want to do something, they just create a study to go study it so they can actually get the study on the books and then just call it a day, right? That's usually the default. So the, the, the unwillingness to do something in the first place, that's so simple. A study is just, you just throw money at a study, pay somebody to do it. You get it in, you know, 18 months. It gets kicked down the road for another two years then you do the fact that that can't even happen is is kind of astounding just as somebody who has witnessed that process over and over again whenever congress couldn't come to an agreement on something panama have you ever asked yourself but since you worked on but since you worked on the cap on capitol hill why won't they if it's the easiest thing to do why won't they do a study that's the question well, a study is easy. For 30 years, they push it down. Now, 32, 33 years, they're pushing it down. Why? Why do you think? Well, to me, because sometimes when you do a study, you get answers. And if you get an answer, then you struggle with the inability. Like, if you get, if you get answers that are reasonable, answers that make sense, answers that communities can get behind, then what do you do? Then you have no choice but to actively try to engage with the responses that you get. Like, I've seen that happen with uh, the program areas I used to work on, there was a there was a a huge change in law that was being that was being like petitioned for, and instead of doing that, they decided to do a study. They got a 350 page study back like 18 months later, and in this study, it ended up doing the opposite of what they were hoping would happen. And then every, then all of a sudden, all the lobbyists and all the the special interest groups were like, "Well, we want what's in there. You guys got to come up with the money for that." And it was like. So I, I think the problem is sometimes you get answers and then once you get answers, people can see these studies are public documents and they're like, yo, we need this. Like, this is right here. So I'm guessing that's probably why they're so. And then there's also racism and white supremacy and all that who are like, why are we studying something that we don't, that whole nonsensical, well, nobody alive was a slave. Nobody alive now was a slave and nobody alive now was a slave owner. Why should, why should these people benefit from or have to pay the debts for people that are no longer alive, which is the stupidest argument ever. So, um. But you're right yeah. about you you get answers you also get receipts they will be going yeah. and showing really and putting and making naming names and making them famous and should they fear that no because i say the truth will set us free but uh you know what you give you get to keep and so since they haven't given they don't get to keep it i agree well i you know i applaud the i applaud the work there like i really uh I mean, I enjoyed the documentary and the way that you can enjoy quality storytelling and all of that other stuff, but also just, it was an interesting story to see a place where it has started, where that has, it's on the books, but also the difficulty. I mean, poor uh, Ms. Ruth Simmons, like she had to get out of that business. She had to get out of it, right? It was just too much, too stressful. She's like, listen, I love my people, but I hate y'all sometimes. Like I can't deal with this stuff because nobody's going to be happy no matter what happens. And I think you know, that's one of those unfortunate side effects that we have to get the work done, but also understanding that everybody won't be made whole in their the idea of being made whole or be happy with an outcome that potentially does benefit the larger community. Like there's a lot of it's, it's, it's just difficult. Like I, I, I truly sympathize and empathize with anybody doing this fight actively because it's not an easy hill to, to get over, nor does it look it's not clean. You know, it's not a clean it doesn't look clean for anybody being a part of it. So it's, it's, you know, I applaud that work. I genuinely, I genuinely applaud everybody fighting that fight 
um, on the front lines, including yourself. Because it matters and, and, and how we speak about it matters. And the way we, we were giving, you know, depth even here to talk about it is phenomenal. So I appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. We're going to take another break and we're going to come back. We're going to talk about a project you have coming out that I think is going to come out really soon. And we're going to get to my favorite segments here on uh, Dear Culture, talking about some black fashion, some black medation. So stay tuned right here on Dear Culture. I'm Torre. Join us for crazy true stories about stars who I really hung out with, like Snoop, Jay-Z, Prince, Kanye, and the time I got kidnapped by Suge Knight. Don't miss my animated series, Star Stories with Torre, from the Grio Black Podcast Network. All right, we're back here on Dear Culture with Eric Alexander. We've been talking about reparations and roles and Hollywood and white supremacy and all manner of things. Uh, but I want to talk about some of the art that you're currently creating. You're in a film that's coming out on Hulu, Wildflower, um, which is an interesting film. I actually watched it. I saw I saw the movie and it was so interesting. It was like, this is a I've never seen anything like this before. It's kind of like a family film with some teen drama type stuff and all kind of stuff involved in it. Like, so tell me about Wildflower and your role specifically in this film and what it was like making this movie that's touching on like a, speaking of marginalized communities that we just don't see in my in my estimation often sure uh wildflower is about a is based on a true story um the director matt uh schmuckler has a niece that has been raised by um his uh, wife's you know sister who is uh mentally challenged and she married a man who is i think they use the word neurodivergent and so, yeah. they are sh- not struggling raising her, but the child is born more in the normal range. And she basically has been raising herself, but also raising them because they have, um, they're not as mature. And um, it's time for her to go to college and it's played brilliantly by Kieran and Shimka. Uh, and she doesn't know how to leave because they're codependent. And she's wondering and, and having the uh, pressures of being a teenager and growing up in that space, but also wanting to rebel and find her way. With your grades and extracurriculars, you have a shot at getting into any college. I can't. You can. No, I mean, I can't leave. So the name Wildflower sort of refers to, you know, a flower that um, that is nurtured by whatever rain comes in and whatever sun um, and is left to grow on its own. Uh, but um, I think what it is, it draws attention to how different families work. We we see a lot of so-called normal families on television because that's what they say people want to see. And um, I don't think that we give enough conversation to how many people have these types of, 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 you know, uh, relatives and uh, family members and friends in their community and in their direct family. So this is a way to, to see that story. And I, I love it. And we got Gene Smart and some really brilliant actors. Dash Mihawk, I worked with before. Uh, Kieran and Shimka, I worked with before in Swimming with the Sharks, although she was seducing me. Now I'm her social worker on here. Now you know how <laughs> weird that is to be being kissed by this young woman on one thing and then suddenly being a social worker and she's a teenager. I said, you know what? I'm just going to have to close my brain down and just say that's what acting is about. But this was a great film and I was glad to be asked to be a part of it. Yeah. And, you know, that's, you know, one of the questions I have for you about that when I watched it was, you know, using a film is a medium that often shows parts of life that we're not familiar with or that people, you know, it introduces you to a world you may be unfamiliar with, especially when it has like real life elements, not fantasy stuff, but like you're seeing families that struggle with certain things or trying to make, you know, basically trying to make it work. What do you hope people get out of seeing a film like Wildflower? I hope they gain an understanding of a larger context about what it is to be human and the different types of way that we show up in the world and um, ways to not only have the conversation, but how can we protect their freedom to have a family? You know, what does support look like? Uh, Sometimes you want to protect people from themselves, but you don't know that you are stopping them from their pursuit of happiness. 
And uh, we need to have more blueprints and templates to show people if they ever come across it or if they have that right now, that their story matters and that they should be able to tell their story, write their books, make their movies, you know, archive this, because it's important over and over and over to, again to show that um, the human um, condition and experience is certainly not a monolith. And it's much more valuable when you see it in all its glory present itself in um, a way that may, you know, educate you. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things since I've been a writer and even podcasting and things like that, one of the things that I've always been a big fan of is everybody having an opportunity to tell their story in the way that they want to. Like for so long, people have been telling the stories of everybody else. And one of my favorite quotes is, and we all we call these things with old African proverb. Who know where who knows where these things come from? But you know, until the lion learns to write, the hunter tells the story, or you know, some variation on that. And I've always felt like it's important as writers and creators to like enable as many people to have an option to tell a story as possible because all these stories are important. And the more that we learn about different types of people, I think ultimately makes the world a better. I know that's kind of like cliche and idealistic, but it is, it's also true, right? Like empathy and understanding is only, uh, you can only achieve it if you see other people and you meet people that are unlike you. Um, so I can really appreciate that type of storytelling. So, you know, kudos uh, to the whole cast and all of you for being a part of this film and this storytelling that really, that really highlights something, yeah. Here's another thing that you know, it's always fun until the rabbit gets the gun. You know, we're having things like the woman king come out, you know, the hunted becomes the hunter, the haunted becomes haunts other people. And I think it's going to be a real switch, Rooney, if you've been in a world that a lot of the, uh, well, not a lot, most of everything we see is done through a filter of white male dominance and supremacy and patriarchy. And then we start to see that there's a new so-called minority majority that is ascendant and that the world culture, the global culture is starting to step in and have a say and be on those same channels and compete, then what happens to the sense of themselves or the sense of us if we've been nurtured and sort of, you know, in this world, we're getting a re-education and, and, and there also needs to be um, an embracing of it because there's great ways to collaborate inside of that. You know what I mean? And not to be a fool and show people how do we collaborate. But I do think you're right that, um, you know, it is different when uh, the the uh, the so-called Native Indians are now telling the story. <laughs> they will start to, you know, tell a whole different story than the one that we've seen thus far. Oh, absolutely. My goodness. Um, all right. So. We'll come to the, the conclusion of the show, my favorite segments, the segments where we have a little fun with our guests. Mm -hmm. And the first the first segment that we do is called a black fashion, which is a confession about your blackness, something black people will be surprised to know about you because, well, you're black. Um, do you have a black fashion that you can share with the people about you, Eric Alexander? Yes, um, I think that my black fashion is that uh, most people would not know that I was born and raised in Northern Arizona in the mountains. And uh, it's hard to picture people being in Arizona at all. They usually picture them if, if anywhere Phoenix, but not in the mountains, not in Winslow or Flagstaff in uh, Bigfoot country. And um, I was uh, born in Winslow. And then uh, very shortly after my parents who were both uh, orphans and they had six kids. I'm fourth in there. Oh, wow. Moved to Flagstaff. So I spent the first 11 years of my life in a hotel called Starlight off of Route 66. Uh, my father was a Church of God and Christ preacher and my mother was a teacher. And um, we lived there and did that uh, where my father was basically a tipped wage worker because that's how preachers are paid past the plate. And as an evangelist with not a home church, it was doubly difficult for him. The German Lutherans discovered him and thought that he might make a pastor. And so they sent him to the Luther Theological Seminary in Philly. And that's how I got to Philly. And in that summer, I got discovered. And suddenly, I also didn't just get discovered in that basement theater called Freedom Theater, where a movie came to town looking for Black and Latino girls to audition for a small part. But also, I discovered that I was young, gifted, and Black. And that was interesting. Up until that point, I had lived in a narrative of basically uh, Navajo, Hopi, uh, Mexican, 
natives and also um, German Lutherans and a few blacks. Well, that is just fascinating. Let me ask you this too. This is not a black fashion so much, but what's something about being on Living Single that fans would be surprised to know about that show? I don't know. I thought there was so much things that were regular about you know the show. I think they'd be surprised to know that we had to um, advocate for ourselves to get air conditioning. <laughs> we're up in there in the valley sweating to death and we had to fight to get air conditioning, fight to get proper um, you know, craft services. It may mean something to, to no one to say, oh, well, what do you mean? Well, we work all day on a set and it's a warehouse. We work in warehouses and we spend our time in trailers, uh, trailers that people hitch <laughs> and, and travel, you know, maybe from state to state. Um, and we flush the, uh, the, 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 the toilet with our foot. It is, everyone thinks that showbiz is glamorous and it is not. It is hard work. And often it is, um, the work where uh, you feel like you're being uh, housed like an animal. <laughs> I'm not even kidding you. Like, you know, you know, uh, and then suddenly at showtime, people show up to put you in pretty faces and clothes and then say action. And then you go back down, you dress down and you come in and rehearse your lines over and over again. And over and over again, 26 times a week work, you learn a play a week. That's what people should get. That every four days, you learn a play a week and you perform it in front of a live audience that is taped. So you're doing a tape show with, you know, the camera and also a live show, two of them. And if they knew how grueling that is, they would get more respect for what it takes to be under that intense kind of stress. But they should also know that that's why we needed uh, a snack every now and then in air conditioning because it was a grueling work schedule. Fair enough. Wow. Uh, perspective. Right. Perspective. Sure. Is I come on the new sets and people are complaining about 10 episodes. And I said, you wouldn't last a day in my world. Not a day. <laughs> All right. So one of the last things we do is we ask our guests for a black recommendation, which is a recommendation about something by for and about blackness, black culture, something that you think other black people should be up on. Ooh. Do you have a black recommendation? Gosh, I should be ready for this. Um, I think they should know that really some of the best stuff happening now is in graphic novel space and comic book space. And my black recommendation is to go to your next Comic-Con and go to Artist Alley and go find the new Shakespeare's and the new uh, Picasso's and all that. The current um, day um, conversation around what's next is happening in those spaces. So you should go meet those people because often they're there and you can meet your heroes right now in real time and start to discover who they are, but also learn what they're doing. They're doing fantastic work there. You'll find me sometimes the Concrete Park and the graphic novel I have, but the thing that I found there was a uh, group of artists that don't do it for the money. They do it because they are compelled to do it because they have to do it. And they tell stories that they want to tell, whether it's science fiction stories or ghost stories or any of that. And um, I'm really glad they're there to show us the way. Sounds good. I will. Uh, I, I like that as a record. We've never heard that before. We've never heard that black recommendation before, but I actually agree with you. I check out graphic novels and things like that. Uh, I have a, a book club I do with a black bookstore. So they always have all of these unique uh graphic novels and stories and the, the owner is always telling me to check these things out sometimes i do sometimes i don't i'm a more of a regular traditional reader but um you know i like that that's a, that's, a, that's a good recommendation what do you have coming up that everybody needs to know about and uh, you know what what you got going what, what do you got going on that we can make sure to be checking out for well, thank you for this I, I i think people should go and, and check out color farm media i'm co-founder of color farm media with ben arnon we've been doing this for now seven years and good trouble you mentioned and the big payback and the big payback podcast finding tamika we did with kevin hart and charlamagne as executive producers and hb sbh um productions but also it's on audible and it was uh, Audible's best true crime um, audio series. And it also got a DuPont Columbia Award. We're very proud. Uh, and we did that with JT Green and Molten Heart. So I'm very proud of the people that we collaborated with. And also, I'm going to have a few movies come out. So last year was a big deal for a TV series. And now the movies that I did are coming. So Wildflower, please check that out on Hulu. And uh, that's fantastic. But also... Um, a movie called Earth that's going to be out July 7th. It's um, um, 
an A24 film. Savannah Leaf is the director, a new film director, her feature debut, Atia Namor and Dochi. Uh, they're fantastic in it. I'm in it. You should go see it for that reason. And then later on this year, November, uh, we just got into the Toronto Film Festival. Cord Jefferson, he was one of the writers of Watchmen. Uh, he won the uh, Emmy for Watchmen with Damon Lindelof. We did a film together. Um, I'm in it with uh, Jeffrey Wright as the lead. Jeff, I play his girlfriend. Jeffrey Wright, um, Tracy Ellis Ross, Sterling K. Brown, Issa Rae, and Leslie Uggams. Fantastic cast. Look good for it. It's a comedy. I think that's going to be fantastic. And thank you for everybody who supported Run the World, which is out right now, and uh, to uh, Corbin and Brisha and Amber, who they're so fantastic, and our writers and crew, and um, uh, Yvette Lee Bowser, who I did Living Single With, is one of the co-creators of that. And I just want to say that anybody that's keep supporting me on Living Single. And um, again, in the work that I've done with HBCUs, going around doing the debate tour in North Carolina, whether it's Howard, doing that with Finding Tamika, the White House has supported us, all the foundations that have come and helped lift and supported us because it is not easy raising money for each one of these projects. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Every time you share or uh, tell somebody about what we're doing, what I'm doing, it really matters. And I've been trying to organically lift and build myself in a way that I think uh, will make you proud. And I, I don't take it, your support for granted, so thank you. Yeah, to make us proud is an understatement. I think everybody who's up on your career could not be happier. We're excited, like you said, a lot of people come and go, but you're still here. I love when I see you on the screen in any capacity. Um, just, you know, listen. Maxine Shaw, iconic character, but you have a ton of iconic characters and things and things that you've done. So thank you so much for everything and everything you've done for the community, uh, both in front of and behind the camera, because you do you're just doing a lot. You got a lot. You got a lot. I'm so still thank you so I'm still strong. Yeah. <laughs> With you. Well, thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you, love. Thank you, Panama. Keep keep it up. The Grio is is a powerful, powerful uh place and um, so necessary. Woo! Never stop. Thank you. We appreciate that. We will continue to do that. So thank you everybody for checking us out. Uh, Dear Culture is an original podcast of the Real Black Podcast Network. I'm your host, Panama Jackson. It is produced by Sasha Armstrong, edited by Jeff Trudeau, and Regina Griffin is our director of podcasts. Have a black one. The 80s gave us unforgettable songs from Bob Marley, De La Soul, and Public Enemy. I'm a black man, and I can never be a veteran. Being Black, the 80s is a podcast docuseries hosted by me, Torre, looking at the most important issues of the 80s through the songs of the decade. Can I have another hit? The dope man stand club. I don't give a A decade when crack kingpins controlled the streets but lost their humanity. You couldn't be like those soft, smiling, happy-go-lucky drug dealers. You had to suppress that. It was a time when disco was part of gay liberation. It provided the information to counter narratives that were given to gay people by the straight world. This is the funkiest history class you'll ever take. Join me, Torre, for Being Black the 80s on the Grio Black Podcast Network or wherever you listen to podcasts.